Megan Hubner, how are you doing? Good. How are you today, Gary? I am good. I'm excited to do this one with you. This is going to be a little bit of a different podcast that I've done in the past, but uh, you know, I think you bring a wealth of knowledge. So uh, thanks for doing this with me. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Yeah. So how has life been, you know, with, with everything that's going on? And I know you recently came back from Mexico, you know, I've right. been doing some real estate investing down there and flipping. So yeah. How's that been? Yeah. We've been back now for just exactly two months, actually. So we spent the last year in Mexico in a city just north of Mexico City. Um, so we were inland. We're not on the beach where most people think. Um, and we had a great we had a great experience in Mexico. We have a real estate project on the go. You're right. We're in the middle of a flip. We're about four weeks away from completion. Um, and then we are back now in Worcester, British Columbia. So we are also thrilled to be back home. It's wet. It's cold. But we're having so much fun. That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. What, what were some of like, what made you decide? to do that um and and what were maybe some of the challenges before we kind of jump into to yeah in go- and going to mexico yeah in, in mexico exactly yeah um i mean you you end up with a lot of cultural differences um and you know one of the reasons we kind of wanted to push the envelope and actually try it is because we thought you know it's something new to learn which is going to be great some of the challenges with closing the property is that things take forever <laughs> like mm. Not only are you signing in Spanish, you're signing in English, then you have to get translators. Um, So there's a lot more legal work, a lot more paperwork. You know, the the process was super interesting. We would go to sign documents and you would have the buyer, the seller, the listing agent, the buying agent, the lawyer, like the entire team is there in a big round room signing like papers. There's no DocuSign. There's, you know, you're not buying um, real estate being in a remote location. You're all there doing the transaction together. Right. Um, so that so that was really interesting. But yeah, again, the processes are so slow. You know, we're a little bit behind right now, probably only about four to six weeks, which I think is actually pretty good. That's actually really um, good. Yeah, I'd say it's it's really good considering the renovation that we did. Like we, it was a f- complete, complete gut. We took out walls. We did structural things. Um, so that part was, um, yeah, the the processes were a little bit slow and challenging and things. But all in all, we were so impressed with how much diligence was done and how professional everyone was. Um, the contracting team that we have there is outstanding. Um, they basically take care of everything from the finishes in the kitchen to the landscaping. So we paid one bill. And and it covers everything. This place that's will be awesome. trained when it's ready. Yeah, that's, that's really good because that, that's mm-hmm. a difficult thing sometimes to manage in a in a different country. And you you may be used to certain processes up here, and then you come down yeah. there, and then not only are you trying to figure that out, but then also there's you know potentially language barriers and yeah, you know contracts that are that are different than what we may be used to in Canada. Yeah. And just the timelines are different. The processes are different. Um, Yeah. I mean, everything, everything was new and foreign to us and it was exciting to learn. And we felt really well connected to the team that was doing the work for us. So we have a real estate agent who's married to the contractor and the contractor oversees everything. So we have a lot of trust in them. We've, you know, my husband was spending, spent about 12 to 14 months with them, getting to know them, touring properties and things, um, looking at pictures, you know, remotely from Canada um, until we really figured out, yeah, this is, this is the, this is the first place we're going to go for right you know what and so that's a great segue into why i have you here because you know managing something like that um and and being that that business owner you you gotta have you gotta know how to manage a team you gotta have the the right systems and processes in place so let's let's kind of start diving into that but let's talk about your background first uh you know and what 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 allows you to have the skill sets to talk about it and we'll kind of dive into i think you know some of the mistakes that a lot of beginning investors do thinking that this sometimes it, it, it turns into this incredible huge business and, and they, they don't have all the, the correct pieces and people in place. Yeah, ab- absolutely. This is one thing that, um, you know, one thing that I find with real estate is that the business grows fast, like crazy yeah. fast. I've worked with a lot of other industries over the past number of years no other business has grown like real estate businesses. They grow from, you can go from one property to 10 properties in a year. That's, yeah. that's big business. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have those systems set up properly, you know, I've listened and I've done some yeah. mentorship and I've, I've seen where investors will have one account for like 10 properties and like, yeah. like whoa, I know I'm like, we we're, like we're, we're behind on bookkeeping. I'm like, no doubt you're behind on bookkeeping. Yeah. <laughs> really so, tricky. So, so, so what were you doing before? 
Yeah. So I spent the last 12 years in the medical sales professional um, with, within healthcare. So I was, I was in pharmaceuticals and then I was in medical device selling to the hospitals. And then when I was, le- when I exited the corporate world, I was the regional sales manager for a, a very large company um, working within the province of BC, uh, managing, managing the entire province and a team, team of sales reps. And I realized at that point that I, you know, I set the goal, I achieved the goal, but I forgot to set the next one. And so when I got to that level, I was in the position for, you know, for over a year and I thought, hmm, okay, well, unless I want to move to London, Ontario, um, you know, there isn't a lot of room for growth here and opportunity. And then I kind of started, my wheel started to turn. And I always explain to people that, you know, when you're in the corporate, you're traveling in this channel and you see things going on out there in the entrepreneur world, but you don't really acknowledge them. And then all of a sudden that channel that you're in has a door and you take a step out and you're like, oh, there's a whole world going on out here. And that's kind of, you know, when I got it, when I got a taste of there's things going on outside of the corporate, um, corporate boundaries that I was already in, I was like, oh, wait a minute, entrepreneurship. And then I sat back and I started to dabble a little bit into entrepreneurship. And I thought, hmm, what if I took my 12 years of corporate, my degree in entrepreneurship, which nobody has, um, and applied it to the small business owner. And that's basically what gave me the confidence to leave the corporate world behind and start doing my own consulting. You know what, that is such an important piece is being in the corporate world, seeing it at a large scale. And in the beginning, maybe like, oh, why are they doing all these meetings or why are they doing like this and this system? But then when you go into the smaller entrepreneurial world, when you first start out, those systems, those processes that they have in place for those larger moving pieces is easier to implement. And then you understand why it needs to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the thing is that it's interesting because, you know, I worked previously in operating rooms, right? So I'm affecting change for thousands of people as far as uh, standardization goes, as far as sterilization goes, et cetera. But now when I can impact one, two, three, ten 10 small business owners, I feel it's a greater impact because I'm basically helping to save them from bankruptcy or I'm helping to get them systems in place so that they can take create general wealth, wealth for their family. And so I feel that's so much more of a greater impact. Yeah. Um, being able to make those changes. Right. So so let's dive into Hubner uh, Consultant Limited. Yep. What exactly is that and what are you doing for, for, for your clients that come to you? Yeah. So I work with primarily real estate investors. Like I said, I had a lot of other industry experience previously, um, but I work mainly now with real estate, anything to do with real estate. Um, and so we break your business down into the four main areas. We take a look at what are your accounting practices. We take a look at your operations, your sales and marketing, and your human resources. And what areas do we need to build, create, put systems in place for you to prepare for growth? You know, you you mentioned earlier, and, and this is exactly right, is that someone starts a business by buying a property and then they buy five properties and all of a sudden they have a booming business. They're creating good cash flow on a monthly basis, but they haven't put all those systems in place to actually start thinking of the business in those four categories. Right. And so what we do is we break it down. Okay. Well, what needs to happen in operations? Like where can we put um, duplicate, duplicatable tasks um, in place so that you can just hit repeat, repeat, repeat on a project management software and have the same execution every time taking a look at your sales and marketing. Like what is your brand? What is your messaging? Um, Do you have a clear communication strategy? How are you trying to get to the end user? What are you going for? Are you looking for private money right now? Are you looking for joint venture partners? Are you looking to just market yourself as an actual real estate coach? Um, You know, then we take a look at your human resources. Do you have one person? Do you have 10 people? Are you doing performance reviews? Do you have accurate job descriptions? Are there things that are, you know, missing or are we, are we, um, are we, is there a breakdown in communication within the team? Like, you know, how are you lifting the team up and helping them with their own personal development? So we take a look at all those areas and we, I basically, it's all a custom program. I don't do group stuff. I only do one-to-one. Um, and we basically look at your business, dissect it apart, and then start building it up in those areas. So let's kind of break down those four areas. So you got operations, yeah. sales, human resources. What was the fourth one? Sales and marketing. Uh, yeah, so operations, sales, and marketing, human resources, accounting, finance, accounting, finances. So the one operations that wants to forget. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's probably why I forgot it. Like I don't like <laughs> that is my business at all. Let's talk about operations and yeah. and where do you see a lot of people make their mistakes there and 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 what exactly does that mean? Operations. Yeah. So operations is how is your product getting out getting out there? So let's take a look. Um, it's specifically in real estate that you are um you're doing a flip. 
Um, a lot of things that you do within a flip are done a time and time again. You can do the exact same step by step process within each of those flip that, flips that you're doing. So we we create within a project management software would create a template to say, okay, these are the repeatable tasks. This is every single time you sign a contract. This is what these are the steps that we're doing. Um, the other thing you can talk about as far as operations goes is, um, let's say that uh, you've got a pro. Um, a management company, right? And so how how is your product or your service getting out there, right? What is the client journey along the way? What steps go into place to go from, hey, we've got a product that we're offering and now it's going to get into the hands of a potential um, business owner who's going to now use your product. So we go through actually executing um, what that step looks like. We create standard operating procedures so that it doesn't matter if you're doing the work or your employee is doing the work, they're getting the same delivery every single time. So is operations kind of like the head of the business? Is it like saying, hey, making sure that there's the right systems and processes for each of the departments? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's like, how does the, how does your product get to the end user, right? So if, if you've got a property management company, how do, how are you how are you bringing in leasing people? How um, What's the step-by-step -step process that a tenant gonna, is going to go through when they land on your desk to say, hey, I want to rent this apartment? What is the step-by-step -step process that they go through? Yeah. Because those tasks are all repeatable. Yeah. And also like defining roles, you defining know, uh, roles for yeah, sure, which is, you know, cause sometimes, you know, say, Hey, look, I'm, I'm really busy. So I just need to hire somebody else. And then you start throwing things at them and it's not, you know, it may not, it's just extra things, but it's yeah. not clearly defined or clearly outlined that, Hey, you should be doing this, or maybe I need to hire somebody else as well too, because this is not part of that role, but I, but it's always difficult in the beginning. Kinda, because yeah. It's, it's also, do I have enough money? Oh yeah, totally. Well, that kind of feeds into human resources, right? So you might say as a business owner, I'm pulling my hair out. I've got too many things to do. I'm totally overwhelmed. It's a word that I hear all the time. I'm totally overwhelmed. Very first place we start is with a high low task list. What are the high value tasks that you're doing on a weekly and daily basis? What are the low value tasks? Let's take those low value tasks, create a job description and hire someone to fill that spot. Now that person who's in the new role is then going to do the operational type stuff. They're going to create the standard operating procedures because they're saying, hey, I'm um, bringing in a brand new tenant this month. What steps am I going to go through? They're going to create the standard operating procedures so we can see how HR is tied to operations. And now all of a sudden you've got a job description for the new person that you're hiring. And that person is going to then create the step-by-step -step process that fills down into the operations bucket. Right. Because... Now you know, the job des description. Right. And so now let's move into, I guess, sales and marketing. Yep. Uh, this, this is where all businesses potentially fail is yeah. no revenue, right? Yeah. Or not letting everybody know out there, Hey, this is what, what we do. This is the product. This is the services that we, that, that we sell. Where do you see a lot of the mistakes happen there? Um, a lot of times, um, you know, especially with new investors is that number one, they're just scared about their story. They're scared to tell their story. So they're not entirely sure what they're marketing or who they're marketing to or what kind of projects they want to take on next. So, um, the, you know, the marketing message kind of gets diluted because they think, well, what's the big deal? Like I did a property, like how should I be talking about this? And I'm just saying, share your story, like start building a story, start building your own personal brand, right? When I, when I think of you, I know that you're in real estate in this area, in this area, and you've got a great podcast and, you know, so you're starting to build that actual brand. So a lot of times it's either the brand of that individual person or the brand of the company as a whole. Well, what does the company stand for? Maybe it is a um, faith-based company that, that specializes on, um, I don't know, multifamily properties and affordable housing, right? Like, so, so getting your messaging out there. So a lot of times they're not really sure what they're, what they're actually selling or looking for. Um, and then on the sales side of things kind of gets tied back into finance as well. Well, they want to, they want to be making sales, but they don't actually understand their cash flow. And so we don't actually a know how many sales they made last month and how much that is more than the previous year. Um, and B what's your break even to run your business on a monthly basis? Do you even know that your fixed costs every month are seventeen hundred dollars, right. right? And so, if you're not bringing in more than that amount, you're going into a deficit each month. Yeah. Um, and you know, really understanding. So again, the sales and marketing aspect is tied to accounting finance to make sure that you're really understanding the foundations of your business to say, hey, wait a minute, I only brought in twenty thousand dollars last month. 
but my business actually cost me $25,000 each month. So now I'm actually in a, in the hole of 5,000. Well, that's, that's why my, that's why I feel so, you know, cash poor and my bank accounts and in the negatives, like, but because the business grows so fast, people haven't taken the time to sit down and say, okay, Hey, fixed costs on this property are X fixed costs on this property are Y. Right. And so it's really just taking a look of breaking the business down into each little category to figure out, okay, what's the, what's the monthly base? What's the monthly cost for this? And then how, what's, what's the full cost of running the business? Right. So is is that where you see sometimes where a lot of businesses fail is not really clearly defining what their brand is? Yeah. Yeah. Not defining their, what their brand is, um, having a sort of a lack of confidence in talking about what they're doing. Um, and it, you can go into the pretty aspect of marketing, the branding and the fonts and all that kind of stuff. Right. But that's not necessarily it. You need to focus in on first, like what, what are you here for? What are you trying to reach people? What's your goal of jumping? You're going to jump on Instagram live. Well, what's your goal? Are you hoping to bring in um, a new conversation with a potential investor? Or are you hoping to share the struggles that you had on the last flip that you did? Because I don't know, the windows were six months delayed or something like that. Right. So really understanding, like, are you trying to educate people? Are you trying to um, give people confidence? Um, You know, you know, what's the actual purpose of getting on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important to, to define that, right? Like, what is your story? What do you, what's your, what's in your core? What do you believe in? Because I think once you can figure that out, then, you know, you're, you're starting to work in your, in your genius or what you're, what you're good at. And then now you're, now you're just sharing that story. Now sharing the story is always a hard part because now you're like, I don't want to go on camera or what, what, what are, what are people going to think about me? Or, yeah. Oh, I, I said this and I should have said that. I mean, listen, man, I, 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 I go through it all the time. I look at the yeah. video and I'm like, Oh, I don't like that video, <laughs> <laughs> but it's out there anyways. And really, I think a lot of times it's, it's, it's you're, you're in competition with yourself. At least that's the oh, way that yeah. I'm trying to look at it now is I'm like, okay, I did like that. I can improve next time, but just, I think it's about getting it out there. And, getting and, out there, getting uh, started, feel confident in sharing the story. Like, sure, you started at one property and now you're at 10 property. That's that's huge. That's a that's a really big success, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't need to share, share all the glamorous stuff too, right? Because people want to see the real side of things. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, as far as the marketing goes, it really is like just starting, just starting somewhere, getting comfortable. I've done lots of, you know, different interviews um, or also presenting to different um, like groups and things. And this is everyone is the first, first place to start. Like, what do I say? Yeah. Tell them about your journey. Right. I'll tell you right now that, you know, we made a mistake in Mexico. I should have not been on title for the first time because you get a tax break on the first sale of your property. Um, so I should have just left it in my husband's name. I should end the next project, but you know, that's something that we learned. So you talk about those things, but until you really understand, like, you know, what is my brand or my business and what I'm here for, it's really hard to start pulling stuff. Yeah. And you know what, you touched on something really important there is that you, 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 people want to also know your mistakes, not just your success, yeah. but that also that you're human, that you made mistakes and here is what you did. And I should have done it like that. They, they, I find those videos, I usually get a lot more reaction out of it. Like, Oh, for sure. He made a mistake and he's sharing it. He's not only totally. just always winning. He also loses and, and fails as well too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So then okay. So we've touched on operation. We touched on sales. Uh, let's touch on, do we touch on human resources? Touched on yeah, a we t- yeah, a little bit. So, you know, yeah. with human resources, a lot of times this, the, like I said, the number one word that I hear from investors is they're overwhelmed. Business has grown so fast. They haven't put any systems in place and now they've got 10 properties. They don't know what their break even is on a monthly base. And they're kind of sitting there going, okay, well, I've got to organize this business quickly. Otherwise it's going to get too messy and too big. Um, and so as far as the human resource goes, is that that's what we first do is we take take a look where do you have help? Do you have support? What's your you know zone of genius? What areas do we need to remove off your plate? I'll tell you right now, I have help with social media. I like social media, but I don't like doing all the posting and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I outsource because I realized that that was a big energy drain and time drain for me. So I have an amazing social media team that helps me with posting. Boom. Fantastic. Now I've freed up my time for other things. And a lot of people think, especially when you go from employee to entrepreneur i gotta do it myself i gotta right. do everything myself now when you say human resources though does that mean that you're hiring somebody new or is it putting processes in place 
It's both. It depends where you are in the business. So if you have a team of um, people working with you already, that's great. We will make sure that you are, uh, you know, up to snuff as far as do you have job descriptions? Um, do you have KPIs? Are you doing annual performance reviews? Right. A lot of times we aren't doing these things and we're sitting there scratching our head as business owners saying, I'm super frustrated. This employee is underperforming. I'm paying a lot of my hard earned dollars to this employee and I'm not seeing the results I'm looking for. So my first question is, okay, do they know what they're supposed to do? Well, yeah, I've told them. Okay. Have you, do you have it in writing? Do you have a job description? And have you verbally communicated it? And a lot of times they're like, well, I've told them. Like, okay, well, it needs to be in writing, it needs to be verbal, and it needs to be in, in a written document of what the expectation is for them. Because we can't really go back to them and say you're not performing when they have either forgotten, they haven't, you know, hasn't been clear in the first place. So we take a look where you're at. Do you need, do you need to put those, those processes in place? Do you need to have a job description? Does the employee need to write the job description for you? Right. You know, quite often as a business owner, you're like, well, I got to write these job descriptions and I can't stand this piece because it's HR and I don't like HR. You've got somebody who's been doing the job for six months. Get them to write it. That's such That's an important piece right there. I know when we did that, when we started having them like because we lost a yeah. couple of people and then now I had to retrain them and there was no manual. And yep. so then now, you know, a year goes by and I'm like, I don't remember how to do that particular role in my business. Yep. Right. And so, you know, you hit an important part is like, yeah, have sometimes it's it's okay. Like, yeah, maybe in the beginning you can clearly define that role. Yeah. Um, but if somebody's there, they can start to help define it for you as well, create the documentation, yeah. um, where to go, right? Uh, and, yeah. and those are important things again that you learn from that corporate world. Absolutely. I mean, and perfect example is you've got, um, you know, you've got someone who has now written their job description, they know what they're doing. Now, you, you as the owner, as well as the employee are talking about what the metrics are in a quarterly basis, like, okay, yes, um, I'm achieving what I'm supposed to be doing. Here's a list of things I'm doing. And then this employee that you think is like your unicorn employee is like, hey, I'm going to work for Gary's company now because I like what he's offering. And I want to learn a few new things. And you think, okay, well, as far as professional development goes, okay, this person is now exiting my corporation and now they're taking all those skills with them. So if you don't have a clear job description and a role of responsibilities, the stuff that they've been doing, you're back at zero because you don't know what they've been doing. And so yeah. now if you have that nice tight job description, you basically just go online, look for your next employee, fill that job description because you've gotten it all written down there with all the roles and responsibilities and boom, you can slot your next person in there. Yeah, so huge. Such an important piece. I think it took us maybe three employees later, like, uh, why don't we have this properly defined? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Right. So yeah. they took all those skills with them that are, you know, relevant to your business. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you want you want to have that all captured without a doubt. And some people aren't there yet. Some people don't have any employees. And so that's fine. We're, they're dealing still in that phase of like one to 10 properties. They're still in overwhelm. Right. So as soon as they create that high low task, we take those low value tasks and I will help them hire their first person. I can help do interviews with them. I can help them create the job description. We'll get that per first person in place so that they can start taking away some of that overwhelm. And, and let's dig a little deeper into that before we move on to accounting and finances. So yeah. what do you see the biggest challenge when somebody's right at the cusp of hiring their first admin? That's always yeah. the scariest yeah. part, I think, of the business. Yeah. Like, like I, I don't feel like I have enough money to pay this person, yeah. but, but, but if I get this other person, it'll free up time for me to potentially create more sales and do work on more marketing. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the first thing that I see is that people don't know what tasks that person should do because they're still, like I said, in that overwhelm, they don't have their list of things that, okay, well, what drives my business forward? Coffees with potential investors. That's going to drive my business forward, right? Email marketing not going to drive my business as much as coffee with an investor. I'm going to help someone. I'm going to write the email. Then I'm going to get someone to help me with the execution of it. So really dividing those tasks and saying, okay, wait a minute. Is this helping me meet my objective? Is it yes? Is it no? And then that's where you start creating the actual roles and responsibilities for that potential person that's coming in. Um, and the other thing too, I see is that people are like, I hired my first admin. I'm so pumped. Like, great. What are they doing? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I've got a whole list of things and I just rapid fire them stuff each day and there's no real consistency and stuff. Right. So what happens is that new employee gets super frustrated because they're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. 
there's not much direction here. There's a lack of leadership. And so I'm sitting here for 10 or 20 hours a week, but I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. I should be supposed to be making stuff up as I go, but I don't really know the business yet because I've only been here for three months. So those are the things that I see happening too, is that then everyone gets frustrated. Yeah. And then all, and then they hire them as well too. And now they like, they want them to do marketing. Then they also want them to do some sales and then yeah. they want them to do admin. And then they, Oh, you know what? Uh, I want you to do some bookkeeping for me too. And then, and then all of a sudden now, you know, you're, you're trying to take the hats off your head and then giving it to your admin and then they're overwhelmed because yeah. they're, they're taking on these different roles and responsibilities. I think that's sometimes where it gets a little tricky, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's very possible that that admin can help you with three of those different functions and things. Um, but again, it needs to kind of all go on that clear job description of what are they responsible for? Right. Nobody likes being, you know, nobody likes getting in trouble for things that they didn't know they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. And sure. then you get the communication dropped as well. So let's move into accounting and financing, mm -hmm. right? I think that's always the part where it can be difficult for like, you know, so as, you know, there's obviously different types of personalities out there for me, yep. financing and accounting want nothing to do with it. I understand the importance of it. So then like, how does that piece work now in that business? Do you yeah. need to hire somebody with a certain skill set in that area? Or do you sometimes maybe just keep that task on your own desk? A lot of times you keep the task in your own desk with support of a bookkeeper and accountant. But a lot of times we're starting at the really, you know, basics. Like I'm working on a big spreadsheet right now that is going to tell you, and I hired someone to help me with this because I like Excel, but I'm not an expert at it. So, I, you know, it's a, it's a snapshot of your entire property. What are the monthly costs? Like, this is something that you did when you were probably analyzing the property in the first place, but have you updated in the last three years since you bought the place, the numbers have totally changed. Do you realize now that, you know, the initial cash flow you had on the property was say 950? Do you realize now that it's 550, right? This is, this is something that you talk a lot about too, right? Really understanding where your portfolio is at with the changes that we faced recent, recently, like what is your break even on every single property? And then once you know that question, answer that question, you know how much you need to make every single month. And then you take it the next step forward, right? Like where, where are all those transactions going? Are they going to one bank account? Are they going to a bank account for each different property? Are they going into two different corporations? Like then what's the routing? So we take a look at where is that, where is the income from that property going? Is it going to the, is it being routed to the right account right now? Um, and if it's not, how can we change that to make things smoother and more effective for you? Right. Um, and then same thing is that, we, yeah, we'll take a look like, you know, do you need to hire a bookkeeper? Is it time? Um, are you up to date in your finances? Have you reconciled in the last year, quarter? Have you completed your, you know, your last couple of year ends? Those are, those are all things that are all brand new moving targets for a lot of people that haven't run that side of the business before. So, you know, it can be as simple as how are you capturing receipts to how are you writing, writing all of your income and your expenses through um, to do you know how much your business costs you every single month? Yeah, that's an important piece of that you just said right there at the end, like how much is your business costing you at the end of every month? Because you sometimes you get so caught up in concentrating on the revenue piece. Yeah, you're not seeing what's happening on the expense side. And that expense side is growing because you're throwing money at it. Like, okay, let's do some more marketing. Okay, let's yeah. do some more bump ups in whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden your expenses, you don't even realize it because that, oh, well, I brought somebody new one. I got to pay for this. I got to pay for a database or CRM yeah. or, and those little hundred dollars here and $200 there, they add up. Those quick. subscription clicks. Oh yeah. Quick. I know. I feel it all the time. And we got to take a step back as well, too, in our own business and take a look at, OK, what can we cut and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what do we need to take on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times, too, with the overwhelming amount of software these days, right? Well, can your software can it can be compressed if you're using Asana for product management? Can you also use it for your CRM? Do you need it to be that robust? Um, do you need a separate CRM? Maybe you do, because maybe you're really working on growing your list right now and you're looking at, um, you're doing a big call for investors soon. So you're really pumping that up. Um, you know, a lot of times we're, we're just jumping on the next fancy thing because we think it's going to help solve all these problems. But in actual fact, then boom, all, all of a sudden you're down $500 because you hit subscribe, subscribe. And then there you go. Yeah. Uh, I had no clue that I was paying this much every single month on subscriptions that I'm hardly using. Right. What are some important, would you say, maybe applications or um, 
yeah, I guess we'll say applications that you see a lot of real estate investors not have, where they're just completely missing it from their business. Uh, I would well, I would say some people in the early stages haven't invested in QuickBooks Online or a software program. They're still using Excel spreadsheet. I say get yourself set up with one property. Get yourself set up. Spend the forty two dollars a month or something like that to make your life a lot easier, for sure. I would say that the other one that I would say is that um, the CRM. Like, yeah. So you're meeting, you're meeting real estate investors, you're meeting um, re, uh, realtors, you're meeting uh, contractors every single week. Well, where are you capturing them? Just in your phone? It's not going to be a robust enough list when you're like, ah, oh, I met someone in Ajax last week and his name started with an M. Where, where can I find him again? Right. Get right. that into your CRM, put all your contacts into your CRM. The thing that I love, my Favorite thing about CRM is that you can keep track of all of your email communications. So it keeps you in touch with what's going on. You don't have to sit there searching your email box to say, hey, did I send Michael um, an email about getting getting the quote? You can jump into your CRM, check out Michael, and you can see right there that you've got your email captured. CRM uh, is so important. They, they really are. I know when we first started, we started off with MailChimp. Uh, yep. Then we moved into Infusionsoft, which is now Keep. And now, because I've grown my real estate team, we're now in Follow Boss. Um, oh, yeah. I think Follow Boss is absolutely incredible where it, it almost takes a lot of the work out of, out of, out of the, uh, the equation where you just, you, my team now wakes up and they know exactly who they got to contact based yep. on the last time they had communication with them. Uh, and, and depending on whether they're not there, uh, you know, in, in, in a hot bucket, a medium or cold or whatever it yep. may be. And, and that, that's what you're, I think what you're alluding to is how important that CRM yeah. is. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you can't remember absolutely. it all as opposed to like, oh, yeah, yeah I, should call, I should call Kim. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't talked to Kim in a while. Yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible to, to keep track, especially as you really start growing your business, growing your name in the industry, um, start networking and stuff. Yeah, I, a robust CRM, I think, is completely underutilized at this point in time, without a doubt. It makes yeah. things so much easier. The other thing, too, is that if you've got a team that's working with you, you don't want to be asking, hey, did you follow up with Kim? You can just log into the CRM and see exactly where the communication lies. Right. Are, are there any other CRMs that you recommend um, that you've used or you've seen other real estate uh, investors? Yeah, I, yeah, I've used HubSpot. Um, I mean, there's there's a CRM component of Asana and ClickUp and Monday.com. Those are all great as well. Um, and I've definitely played in all of those. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it depends on the business. We're using ClickUp for one of our businesses right now. We're using Asana for another business. Um, yeah. Those are all, those are all great options as well. And there's a lot of free versions as well, too. Okay. You can start, I mean, there's a free version of HubSpot. Super right. easy. So if somebody's listening to this right now, what are a couple of things that they can do right now to tweak their business, right? Just like some little small tips and saying, Hey, yeah. just turn this dial here and turn that dial there. And you can really start to see some great improvements in your, in your real estate business. Uh, number one, I would say is to understand your finances. Yeah. It is such a hot topic in this industry right now, right? There are, are people that are doing really well and there's people that are struggling and it just breaks my heart to see them struggle. I don't want that for anyone. Um, so number one is understand your finances, how much money is coming in, how much money is going out, what are your fixed costs so that you really know your business. Um, and then the ne ne number two, as I would say, is the overwhelm is that a lot of people are still juggling nine to fives. They haven't become real full-time real estate investors yet. So, okay, take a look, do your high, low, what are my high value tasks? Where are my low value tasks? Is it time to start outsourcing some of those low value tasks to an assistant, a virtual assistant, um, a bookkeeper? Like where are you really getting hung up mm -hmm. and not being efficient? Yeah. You know what? Th that's also a good way to also kind of slowly move into it. If you're new and you're starting to get overwhelmed where you have that nine to five job and you're trying to move into that entrepreneur world is getting that virtual assistance, right? Because yeah. uh, sometimes they can be a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but where do you see people make mistakes with that virtual assistant? And, and is there a difference between VA and having an actual, um, we'll say, you know, somebody that, uh, is close to where you're working or where your business is, or maybe even in your home or in your office? Yeah. Um, I mean, most people just need someone who, it doesn't matter where they are. It could be remote, okay. could be a different time zone, et cetera. Um, I think the, the biggest mistake is that people don't really have a clear function of what they want them to do. So spend the time, spend two weeks on a time audit, figure out what your low value task is, your high value task, figure out what you're going to create a list, a job description for this person before you hire them. 
because then you know what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who's got these skill sets that you really need, you know, help with right away. I don't think it matters geographically where they are unless you have an office space that you want someone in the office with you. A lot of us work at home, but again, I mean, I've only ever worked from home, even in the corporate world, because I'm in BC, I'm not in Ontario, the center of all the, the big corporate hubs. Um, so you do need to make sure that that person obviously is going to be kind of self-motivated. And when you move from the employee to entrepreneur, you have to learn how to become that self-motivated driven. And a lot of people are, but still it's a lot of areas where people struggle too. So do you need to go to in a separate office space? Do you need to have someone beside you, like knowing how you work best? is also really important. That's actually another good point as well, too, is also, you know, when you are an entrepreneur, is to be self-driven, is to get up and uh, and show up because mm -hmm. you are no longer, uh, you know, you're not reporting to anybody. You're reporting to yourself. Yep. And so are you driven? Do you have the drive to get up and do the work or or to stay later? to stay longer to 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 get the work done because in the beginning it's not it's not easy at all right yeah. and you can make as much money as you want potentially you yeah. know if, if you've got a good product or service or you know you could you can crash and burn real fast and real quick yeah absolutely yeah absolutely it's yeah. it's a bit it's a big change when you're now all of a sudden working for yourself and you are the one who's driving everything forward um yeah. and now you're responsible for someone else's livelihood too right you hired someone at 20 hours a week and now you you need to pay them every week well they need to know a what they're doing first because that's going to create a lot of frustration um but yeah it just really you know it's um, and that's why you need to know your finances first before you say hey i'm going to hire someone do i have the money in the business am i going to look to invest the money in the business how how is this all working yeah and sometimes even in the beginning it's okay just to work from home i think sometimes you know when they when they transition they think they've got to get this office and then now they've got to get uh you know like spend all this money and when it's okay to just work from home in the beginning keep some of your expenses low absolutely and 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 kind of get that 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 ball rolling right yep yeah absolutely you know that is, and it goes back to the accounting finance piece right knowing your numbers okay do i have um, or even just knowing yourself, how do you know yourself? Like, are you going to be a self-starter at home? If you're not, then you might need to rent a temporary office space. Yes. Right. And so just really understanding how you work best is going to be, is going to be really important for you as well. Yeah. That's important as well. Yeah. Like, I mean, even for me, right. Like when I get up in the morning, I still go take my shower. I still get dressed. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. Like I'm, I'm getting, I'm ready to perform. Yeah, you know, because it can be very easy sometimes. And I'm, and I'm sure depending, again, what you're saying, like depending on that individual, you know, if you're all of a sudden now just in your t-shirt and jogging pants, you know, is that going to fire you up? Maybe, maybe some people can work like that, but maybe some other people where they've been in that corporate world for so long, they still need to to dress up and show up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think COVID taught us a lot how to work from home. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. Right? laughs> um, but yeah, really understanding your own personality style and really understanding what motivates you and what's going to turn the dial. And maybe, you, you know, I, 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 it, when I have my early morning calls at a coffee shop nearby, I see the same couple of people there chipping away at their computer at 6, 37 in the morning, because obviously that would, that's what works best for them, right? They're not on calls or anything like that. They're just sitting there pounding out what they need to be doing, but they know that they work best from the coffee shop at that point of the day. And so that's why they're there showing up for themselves. Yeah. What do you recommend that, you know, somebody who's starting off uh, being in, into the entrepreneurial world, how do they start their day? I think that's always a tricky thing, especially that first transition. I know it took me a while yeah. to kind of figure out, like to get my groove of what my day is going to look like, especially more in the morning as well, too, because that, that really kind of can sometimes change the way that day goes or even the week. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I've done, I've done lots of phases. If I'm going to get up, I'm going to do 10 minutes of stretching here. I'm going to have a liter of water, lemon water first. I've done lots of those things now yeah. because I've done that for so long. I know exactly what I need when I wake up. I'm like, how am I feeling today? Check in with myself. Am I feeling like the change in the weather? Am I feeling uh, really tired from last night? Cause I have a young child or like, you know, checking in with yourself is the biggest one. Right. And then really what do you need next? And I always want people to have a tool, like a toolkit, basically. These are the things that really amp me up or get me motivated. Number one, hot coffee. Number two, um, a 10 minute meditation. Uh, number three, journaling. Number four, pulling a, an Oracle card maybe. Um, and so really understanding what is in your toolbox to fire you up. 
and then really tuning in. So if it works for you to say every single day, I'm going to drink a liter, liter of water, do 10 minutes of stretching, a 20 minute meditation, um, and then I don't know, um, make an egg, whatever it is, right. right? So you just need to know yourself. So get your toolbox ready. What are the things that fire you up? And then tap into, okay, do I need to have things the exact same every single day? I had an employee he, who had a half a cup of oatmeal with four dates and two almonds every single day. That doesn't work for me, but that worked the heck like great for him. So really knowing what you need in the morning is going to be the best thing. But I really think that that list of, of tools in your toolbox is going to be the best. The other thing that I recommend for people to do is look for a pattern interrupt. If you are in that funk because the morning didn't work for you or the kids were all yelling, if you're in that funk, what is going to interrupt your pattern? for the day and not let it ruin your day. And going back to that toolbox, is it a meditation? Is it a 10 minute walk? Is it your favorite song? Do you recommend, so it sounds like you, you should almost have like an hour to yourself in the morning. Do you ever recommend where you just jump up and start working? If you can do it and that works for you because you know how you work, go for it. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I'm in BC, you guys, you've all been working for three hours before I even, even up, right? Um, so yeah, if it works for you, I'd say absolutely go for it. Some yeah. people are night hours and owls and they want to put the kids in the house to bed first and then they want to go for two more hours. That does not work for me. Right. Yeah. So you got to kind of know what works for you. And sometimes, you know what, it could be an age thing. Cause I know when I first started, uh, you know, our business, smart home choice, I was a night owl, but it was yeah. also because I had a nine to five job. And so when I came home, I was, that was your time. one, two in the morning, getting up and then going back to work. Now I find like where I'm at now in the stage is like, now I'm, I'm waking up earlier and I'm going to bed earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't Nothing know to do with your thing. age. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it does. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with my age. Right. But um, yeah, I, th I think it also, I think you're right though. Right? It really depends on your personality. Uh, I know for me now, I like to, to at least have an hour to myself. Mm -hmm. um you know whether it be working out whether it be going for a walk whether it just be sitting down having a coffee and, and having uh you know a conversation with my wife but you know I, I kind of like to have just an hour just to kind of figure things out and then I spend a little bit more time just before I start on designing my day like what is yeah. my day gonna look like knowing that yes sometimes things get thrown in there but if you can plan that day out to say and this is how I want it to look it mm -hmm. makes such a huge difference yeah, I would even argue that those things should be done the night before. Yeah. And so you don't have to wake up and spend the hour focusing on what you're going to do today. You already know, you wake up, you know, it's Friday. I'm doing accounting reconciling. I am doing um, quarterly reviews and I'm, you know, analyzing five properties. It's Friday. I, that's what I, I do on Fridays. I think that's a good point. I, I can't remember who said it, but, uh, you know, um, essentially what it does as well, too, when you write it down the night before is while you're sleeping, sometimes your brain will help figure yeah. that, that problem out for you. You wake up like, oh, okay, boom. Yes. I, got a, I got a better idea. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, so let's say now, you know, somebody's listening to this and they're like, okay, I, I like what Manga has to say. Yeah. What's kind of like the first step and, and, and what does that look like working with you? Is this like a yeah, week program? Question. Is it a few months? Is it a year? Am I, do I have you for life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good questions. Good questions. Um, it is a six month minimum to work together. We, we have different positions. So we, you could have a single position spot, which is at one weekly call monthly WhatsApp support Monday to Friday, and then email communication as well. So we meet at the same time. I try and keep it pretty consistent. Same time every single week for six months. Within that time, the first six, six to eight weeks, we're just going to uncover, peel back the layers of your business. What is going on? What's the current situation? Where do we need to go? What's the goal? Um, and then after that, after about six weeks, once we've really dove into the business and really started to understand it, we start creating plans. Okay, what kind of strategic marketing plan in place do we need to have? Wait, wait a minute. We're not at marketing yet. We're still at accounting. Okay, let's stay in accounting right now until we figure out what your numbers are, how much your fixed costs are, where your money is coming to and going and flowing to. Um, but then we've also got HR issues. So we're going to combine those at the same time. So we tend to work on those four buckets for the entire amount of time. Most people st uh, stick with me for anywhere from my longest standing clients, about three years, but um, you know, most people around nine months to do the work, depending on the size of their business. You know, I had a question recently, like, when do you want it? When do you want to capture people? Well, ideally I captured them earlier than later, 
because then we get a solid business foundation in to prepare them for that growth rather than getting to the growth phase and then working back to say, okay, wait a minute, we got to break down all these things now. Mm -hmm. So it's a six month minimum. Um, It's a one hour position. If you've got two people on your team, you've got a staff that you want trained as well. You can add uh, two positions or three positions. Again, same thing. Everyone gets a weekly call. Everyone gets WhatsApp support, email communication for me to look at job descriptions or, you know, pop on an interview when you're looking to hire someone, those types of things are areas that I all support. So what do you mean when you say everybody gets a call? So let's say now I have a team of five people. So that would be five, five positions. So you would have a package that is five positions a week. So that would be f- yourself and then your, your, your staff, if you want them trained as well. The other thing you could do is you could have your weekly position and you could have one weekly position for staff. So if you have an accounting department, we can work with that person for the first Got it. Three, three months. And then the second posi- uh, the second three months, we could work with say your, your HR team or your marketing team, et cetera. Got it. Now, how large of a business size will you go up to? Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a single person. So if it's a staff of 20, I would probably need to have support. Right. Um, but I would then just outsource that kind of thing. I wouldn't say that there's any maximum at this point in time. If you came to me with hundred employees, we'd make a plan that's unique to you, which is why I work just one-to-one with people. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. business is so unique. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I just thought of something as well, too. And I think this is also a big problem. At least I know for me from time to time is notification. And mm. I've turned off quite a bit of my notifications on my phone. Is that where you see a lot of entrepreneurs have issues because they don't want to miss potential business, whereas coming in from WhatsApp, Messenger, Instagram, Facebook, email, We're inundated these text, days. It's it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I always recommend people have a clear communication strategy, like with your team, you might keep it all in Slack. Right. And so, you know, that if you're switching off for the weekends, that the Slack messages can wait because that's all where your team is sitting. Um, yeah. I mean, notifications, absolutely. If, if they're taking over your life, turn them off without a doubt. Um, or maybe you only, you know, the reason I do WhatsApp communication is because I want people to have quick, rapid response. So I'll usually get back to people within hours to two hours, depending if I'm on calls myself. Um, but it's also training the people that a you're working with and and your clients too. Yeah. Yeah. Notification is such an important piece. And, and sometimes it can really kind of break you because now you're working on something and all of a sudden you get this uh, notification from Instagram and it, and it, the, the alarm sounds urgent. Yeah. It's like it's your friend who posted a video about, uh, I don't know, some cat dog or toddler or something. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and and that's where you really got to be careful because and then yeah. I think I read something and correct me if I'm wrong here where it almost takes you sometimes 10 to 15 minutes to get back into your train of thought yeah I think it's even more than that I feel like it's like 21 minutes okay yeah it's a long time you know if you're really doing that that focus work and things um and you get all those notifications those inundated uh, you know coming in unless it's like a phone call from the school those are ones you want to answer, of course, right? But you can set your you can set your notifications on those. I do recommend time blocking a lot for sure. Yeah, time blocking. Uh, mm-hmm. Do not disturb times. Yeah. Right. Yeah, sure. and it's and then again, it goes back to how well do you know yourself as an employee, right? Do you know that every single time there's a beep, you're getting distracted? Well, you gotta you gotta turn your ringer off. Yeah. Yeah. For right. Sure. Or maybe they don't bother you. That's yeah. fine too. Just know yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, anything we did not cover or where, you know, it's really important for somebody who's moving into this space in the real estate investing world, um, or the entrepreneurial world that, you know, be careful of this pitfall, be careful of this mistake, what you see all the time happening with your clients. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I I think the biggest thing is the finances. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. And it's, it, it could be anything, right. It could be from them not having an accounting software set up yet to them, not really understanding where their numbers are at right now um, to lack of clarity in the whole portfolio. Um, yeah. I think if anything, I can encourage anyone is to understand your numbers on a deep level so that you know what the business is costing you, you know, what your properties are costing you, you know, you know, kind of where your goal is and what you want to achieve. Yeah, that was really important. Do you ever see anybody quitting too early their full time job to go into their their entrepreneurial? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, isn't it? You must see this too, right? 
yeah. they, they, you know, they've, they've gotten so excited. They're really feeling fired up. Um, but then there's, you know, and you might be on the high, right? Entrepreneurship is the darn roller coaster, right? You're going to feel top of the world one day, the day that you quit your job, you're going to feel top of the world. You're going to think I can achieve anything. And then the next day something happens, it derails it. And you're like, Oh my gosh, what have I done? Yeah. Right. So you have to be prepared for that roller coaster. So yeah, I would say, you know, wait until you know your numbers, really understand what your own personal expenses are, what you need, and then where you want to go. Yeah. I remember Jim Rowan has had this quote. He said, don't quit your full-time job until your part-time job becomes your full-time job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you yeah, listen, when, you, when you go to those networking events, you go to a mastermind event and you go there for the first or the second time, you're like, this is the life I want to live. F my boss. And then you, you go home that night and you flip that email and all of a sudden you're like, what did I just do? Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I just committed. And then people get scared. Right. Mm -hmm. And then fear leads to inaction. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're spinning. Yes, exactly. And it doesn't take long to just sit there and start spinning. If you don't have clearly defined uh, goals, objectives, yeah. And, and where you're really trying to go with this, because, you know, I've said this before too, like, you know, yes, I'm into real estate investing, but I also don't love real estate investing. It was just a great vehicle. It, it's it's not, yeah. it doesn't define me. This is a yeah. vehicle that I use. And so what else am I building out of this entrepreneur world, this business that I've, that I've created for myself. And so you got to really get clear on your goals and why, and your why, your why is yep. incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. Your why is incredibly important. It's, you know, it's going to be the driver for you every single day. Like you said, you wake up, you want that hour to yourself. If you've got the hour, fantastic. If you don't have the hour, that why needs to be so strong because mm -hmm. you're going to trudge the mud first and then you're going to stumble here and, you know, really, and then same thing with your community, being connected to the community to make sure that, you know, everyone is, is traveling along the same path. Because this is one thing that I say to people often is that, um, you know, if you walk in and say, Hey, I want to land an 85,000 or I want to have an $85 million portfolio. That is my goal. And a lot of your friends and your family and your circle, as much as they love you, they're like, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Right. And so all of a sudden you're getting brought down again. Yeah. That's like crab in the bucket mentality. And yeah. it's not that they don't want you to succeed. Totally. They're, they're, they're actually trying to protect you. Yes. Because they're Keeping not going safe. to the same rooms that you're going to or talking to the same people or, you know, like, hey, be careful, man. They're like, this is a scam or it's this or whatever. It yes. Be. Right? Yes. Oh, 100 percent. Then you go into these any of these meetups, real estate investors, and you meeting with some big people. And they're like, yeah, right on. How are you going to get there? What are you going to do? What's your what's your strategy? Yeah. Right. They're not going to question anything other than that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Listen, absolutely. Megan, this was a, a great conversation. I think this is really important for a lot of real estate investors that are getting into this game. Um, and especially with everything that's happening right now, where, you know, some people uh, quit their full time jobs um, during this time and interest rates have gone up. And now they're like, OK, well, what do I do? How do I pivot? Um, listen, even for myself, and, and I share this as well, too, is that, you know, I've had to pivot a little bit harder into more active income. Yeah, but you, but you have to know. And listen, I tell you this: um, I realized that I did not. I thought I had a recession-proof business. Er, wrong. <laughs> you know, I yeah. I, didn't, I didn't plan for eleven interest rate hikes, so I've had to shift the pivot. You know. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah, and sometimes you got to have those backup plans, or you know how 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 can you maneuver within your business model? Yep. Yeah. And knowing your business model, knowing your numbers, understanding your business as it relates to those four buckets is going to help you make those strategic decisions of which way to go next or what decisions you need to make from a high level, right? We Business owners, we want you to stay up here. We don't want you in the weeds making all the small decisions, yeah. right? We want to stay up here so you can stay high level, making sure that you're making good long-term goals and strategies for the business. Absolutely. And, uh, and I heard this as well, too, from one of my coaches is that, you know, you should be firing yourself every four or five years, meaning yeah. that, you know, you're growing, you should now have other people, whether it be filling those, those previous roles that you were doing, so you can continue to yeah. not work in your business, but on your business. Yes, exactly. Right. That's the, that's the high level stuff is working on it. Yeah. Any last piece of advice, Megan? Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I think the, the biggest thing you guys is just to really start looking at your business as a business, 
right? It doesn't matter if you have one property or if you have 101 properties, you have a business. And so the faster you start to look at it that way, and the other thing it's going to do is that's going to give you the confidence to start making some of those bigger type decisions and bigger steps and things too. So recognize you've got a business, start treating it as one and really get yourself, you know, in a position for growth. Yes. Treat it like a business. Yeah. Great words exactly. of advice. <laughs> uh, listen, I've enjoyed this uh, this talk with you. How can people get a hold of you if you want to learn more about what you do? Or, sure. or they're like, I need your service. I need you to help me. Yeah, run over to my website. You can grab a uh, complimentary call there. We'll book a quick strategy session for 30 minutes. It usually takes about an hour, to be honest, by the time we dive into your business. Um, so you can go over to my website at meganhubner.com. Grab your grab your call there. I'm also quite active on Instagram at Megan Hubner. It's M-E-G-H-A-N-H-U-B-N-E-R. Um, and the other place that you'll see me is on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Megan, thank you so much for your time. You're um, welcome. And, and it's been great getting to know you and thank you for your friendship. You know, it's, it's Oh, you're welcome. I've really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. So I'm glad, you know what? Social media is a great place. You know, I've, I've met some incredible people and uh, you're in the top of the list. So thank you for your time. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye.